Good morning. And welcome on this rally Sunday as we gather to worship as our Sunday school begins its new year. Glad to have you all with us. Want to highlight a few of the announcements that are in the bulletin. First of all, I do not think we're traveling back in time to August 27th. I think that is because I got the bull I thought I emailed it to them on Monday and Faye finally on Friday said, like, you want this stuff yet? And so I emailed to Rebecca at the last minute. But the others are all valid. We do still need volunteers for the uh, back what used to be the backpack program is now and now it's feeding the CSC families on the third Wednesday of each month to join us at Milton Town Hall to take the food and sort it and pack the boxes. I have found that 99% of those of you who have volunteered and said you were interested have commitments on this day. So I, as Cindy suggested, seeing if they would be willing to drop off the food for this at the same time that they drop off our food pantry food and bring it here so that we could then pack it here and then bring it for that Wednesday. Um, I'm going to check with Kayleen on that and see if that works. If it does, I'll let you know that. If not, we need the volunteers for the 20, uh, 20th. Also, I will not be here next week. I will be on vacation visiting family in Massachusetts, or as one of the members of Hope said when I announced it, that I'm going back to work on my Massachusetts accent so that when I come back, I can say I'm missing my khakis, and you won't know if I'm missing my pants or I want to take a drive. <laughs> but Betsy has graciously agreed to fill in for me next Sunday, so she will be here. Two weeks from this Sunday is the Pet Blessing, and that will be out at the Cochrane Park next to Hope Church. This is a joint service. Please bring your pets on leash or in a crate or a similar type of container. Bring your friends to have them uh, come and be blessed. You have not the friends blessed with their pets, but their, their pets. And then also bring a dish to pass and a chair or blanket or whatever you would like to sit on that day. This was a fun service but it, last year, but it also reminds us of that God's love and God's care is for all of creation. And finally, actually not finally, but the Wednesday the 27th will be confirmation and exploration orientation. If you are in seventh grade and above or know somebody in that age group, please come. It does not mean that you have to be part of it. We'll go over what it requires, what I hope you get out of it, and then um, you can decide at that point. Finally, it is now Hope's Fall. <clears throat> you can tell my voice is not, may not make it this <laughs> It's Hope's Fall campaign or pizza sale. I'll have this sheet out here. You can, there's going to be a sign-up sheet out on the where the bulletins are, if you want to order pizza there. If you're tech savvy, you can go to their website and order from there. And if you're really tech savvy, you can go to this box here, this QR code, and take a picture and it will take you there. So we have all methods for all levels. This will be, all orders are due on October 1st, and pickup will be October 14th between 3 and 4 at the church. Are there any other announcements? Yeah. Uh, I just want to meet uh, real quickly after church with my consistory people uh, regarding uh, next consistory meeting date and uh, our, our fall uh, joint consistory meeting. Um, so something I come up with that. So, so just real quick right after church. Yeah, twice a year, the close consistories here and Hope meet together just to make sure that relationships stay as smooth as they have been. Any others? Then I invite you to stand as Beth comes forward to lead us in our responsive call to worship. <laughs> Let our praise today be made new. May we sing a new song. Pray a new prayer, dance a new dance, and seek and hear a new word. 
Let the faithful delight in the Holy One's marvelous acts. Let us glorify God with our voices, the work of our lives, and the joy of our souls. The glory to God. Praise the Holy One. Our opening hymn is number eight, Praise to the Living God. Please join me in singing this hymn. Oh, 
Is that any of the children who'd like to come up for a few moments of conversation? And I'll warn the adults that since we forgot to do the many penny last week, we will be towards the end of the children's story, sending them out to collect any spare change that you wish to donate. So good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. So today is the first day of Sunday school, right? Yeah, that's an easy, that was an easy question to ask you. I wonder what you do in Sunday school. You have, remember? You kind of forgot. But what do you do in general? I'm not talking about anything. You watch your videos. What are the videos usually about? Are they about like sports or cartoons or church? But probably stuff about Bible and Jesus. What else do you do? What does Miss Liz do? She sings. She has you guys sing together, and then you come up sometimes and sing with us. Sunday school. I almost wish I could go back to Sunday school because I also know you color and you do crafts sometimes. And I enjoy doing that. But Sunday school is a place where you're making friends and you're learning about God and about Jesus and their love for us. And it's also a place where we are learning, hopefully, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, someone who is a, calls themselves a Christian. And one of the things that their Christians are asked to do is to share with each other. And so you guys do the men and the penny so that you can take the change there and share and help someone else, or a lot of someone else's, in Jesus' name. Yes, Wyatt. You can take the big one, yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to send, I'm going to send you out to get those. So we'll get the big one and a couple of collection plates. Hopefully the rest of you have pockets. <laughs> or you can go together. That's a lot, yeah. Has anybody not given that wants to? They miss anybody. All right, then I'll invite you guys to come back up. All right, go sit down, though. Boy, you can put the hand there. And then if the two will have the plates, I'll bring those and those in. I'm going to be small. That's a lot, yeah. So you're going to be able to help some people real well. So, I stand up. <laughs> we're going to pray. We're going to pray for, give thanks for the people who gave and for the people who will benefit from this. And as I usually do with you at this time, I'm going to ask you to repeat the prayer after me. I'll try to give them small enough phrases for you to remember, okay? So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this money so that we can help others experience your love. We thank you for the people who gave us this money and trust us to use it in good ways. We ask you help help us to decide what to do with it and where we can do the most good. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can go off to Sunday school. As they head off to Sunday school, we come to our time in service where we share readings from our Holy Scripture. Our first reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans. At this point in the letter, he has turned from basically chastising both the Jews and the Gentiles for insisting that they're God's favorite child and telling them that God doesn't have favorites, to now how they are to live as one community. I invite Bev to come up and share our first reading. Good 
reading this morning is Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Our second reading comes from the good news according to the Gospel of Matthew. It comes as Jesus knows that he is getting closer and closer to Jerusalem and his probable death. And so he has picked up his teaching, both of the crowds and of the disciples. At this point, he is in the midst of a rather long stretch of teaching in Matthew, filled with parables and lessons. And so today we hear a parable that sets up the lesson he has for his disciples. Let us listen for God's voice speaking these words. Jesus said, Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you in heaven, their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went away? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. If another brother or sister in the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If they listen to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, Take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of one or two witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let one such be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. May God add a blessing of understanding to our hearing of these words. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and spirits be inspired by your Holy Spirit, and thus make pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Commentator and professor David Loos does not like it when today's gospel passage shows up in the schedule of readings. Maybe that I've known way too many Christians who are more than eager to go out and point out the fault of someone who has sinned, most writes. Or maybe this goes all the way back to my days in InterVarsity Publishing, when this passage was regularly cited, first as a way to handle disputes, and then as a rationale of why a backsliding member of the fellowship should be shunned. No matter how you slice it, I just can't seem to find a reason to like this passage, which of course is why I can't seem to let it go. And he isn't the only one. Numerous commentators and essays express that feeling of discomfort. 
even outright hate of the last part of this passage, with similar objections to what Los had said. And that may be because today's gospel reading is often pulled out whenever a church is experiencing conflict, when members are causing difficulty within the congregation because of what they are saying or doing. And over the centuries, churches have used these verses as a checklist to quickly get through conflict in a biblical way. Go to the person alone, check. Didn't work, bring another with you, check. That doesn't work, bring it to the consistory or to the congregation for a vote, and if that's not the case, then cast them out like Gentiles and a tax collector. And all the time, you can, they congratulate themselves for protecting the sanctity of the institution. But I don't think that Jesus is offering a checklist here. For in Matthew, Jesus has just finished that parable of the lost sheep that we heard, when a shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one who has wandered away. And it's followed by Jesus' answer to Peter of a question of how many times he should forgive someone within their faith community. And Jesus answers that he's to do it seven times 70. Now here Jesus is addressing the members themselves, not that shepherd, those leaders of the community. But this is about the congregation that is there and stays as pastors come and go. And notice that Jesus assumes that there will be conflict among his followers. In fact, he's already experiencing it. The disciples are starting to argue about who is greatest among them. Also remember that in Matthew's Gospel, sin is not about the particular act, but it's about the break in relationship. The break in relationship with each other, and the break in relationship with God. So when sin happens, that is, the break in relationship between church members, Jesus offers the way to restore relationships and reconciliation. Now, early in my ministry, I took a one-week conflict resolution course at the Lombardi Mennonite Peace Center. One of the exercises involved a two-student role play of a scenario of conflict that might arise in a congregation. The teacher put them on opposite sides of the table and placed an easel up at the head. And as the leader wrote a brief synopsis of the scenario on the chart, he asked all of us what was the crucial first step in trying to resolve a conflict and do so in healthy ways. And so we all offered the answers such as getting at the true facts, listening to each other, making it a safe space to share, and each time he said that was a good point, but those were the tools that we would use to get to that first step. Finally, he asked the two students to stand up. He pulled that chair and put it next to the other, moved the easel so it was facing them, and said this, this is the first step, getting them on the same side of the table, acknowledging what the problem is. Only it was as easy as moving two chairs around. Being on the same side of the table doesn't mean that you already agree. But it mean, it's a means by which people, congregations, can come to a mutual expression of what the problem or conflict is, which is sometimes the hardest thing to do. It changes the process from adversarial to cooperative. No longer is the other person or group someone who has to be overcome. They become someone to work with, to find a way for the congregation to move forward. It helps break that your side, my side, winner or loser mentality. And it opens up the space for reconciliation and healing. And so Jesus lifts up a way of relationship that emphasizes love over moral righteousness. 
Jesus offers a path of reconciling the community where it's healthy and possible over protecting its sanctity. For as Debbie Thomas declares, Jesus offers us a radically different path. In fact, he doesn't just offer. He tells us plainly the way we should conduct relationships here and now, and that that has a direct consequence on God's coming kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, she concludes, the depth, the health, and the quality of our relationships within the church really matter. They matter eternally. And because they matter, Jesus points out that we just can't ignore conflicts or avoid them. Jesus offers a way to address these conflicts so that we recognize that each person involved is a child of God. We respect their dignity by first going to discuss things one-on-one. -on -one. It's only if this fails that we start to add more people who become part of the work. So different from those parking lot meetings after church or gossiping about it at the quick trip later in the week. Jesus emphasizes here, all parties are brothers, sisters, siblings in God's love. But Jesus also recognizes that sometimes such reconciliation is impossible. Times when you can't get all parties to the same side of the table. Times when parties won't take accountability, so the potential for ongoing harm to the vulnerable within a congregation or the congregation itself is too great, and so you must part ways. When that happens, Jesus tells his disciples, you are to treat them like tax collectors and Gentiles. And since these were the groups that in Jesus' day were often labeled as outsiders, even traitors to their fellow citizens and faith, churches throughout history have seen this as a permission to not only break the community's relationship with the party, but to justify shunning them, branding them as a heretic or worse to whoever will be listened. It's been used against those who break some moral code of the community that has nothing to do with the health of the congregation. Think of the book, The Scarlet Letter, which, while fiction, depicted the real case on the ground. The problem is that these things miss. They miss whose mouth the author of Matthew has these words coming from. It's Jesus. This statement is said by <clears throat> Jesus, the one who was criticized for eating and hanging out with those tax collectors and sitters, who even invited some of them to become his closest disciples. It's said by the one who is living out these words, both in the relationships with them and through God's ongoing reconciling work. Even in that ultimate conflict, his betrayal and abandonment by his disciples, Jesus shows that we are to continue to hold the other in love, in the hope of God, and treat them with the grace as another beloved child of God. Make no mistake about it, this is hard, and it is work. This is hard because it emphasizes reconciliation and healing. So much in history and our culture demands revenge or payback, insisting that there must be a punishment that is so harsh to teach a lesson and to deter others. But paradoxically, also, we have a society and culture that goes against addressing conflict, wanting to minimize or deny wrongs and hurts for the sake of the community or the greater good. It isn't that such times, such times of conflict should be met with smiles and nicety, 
which is often the way congregations deal with it until it explodes into even more disastrous and wide-ranging event. Sometimes it even causes congregations and individuals to be eaten up on the inside. Over the last few decades, we've witnessed the damage done when clergy were shuffled from one church to another after allegations of child or sexual abuse. It's hard work because doing this requires acknowledgement of the harms in both big and small, and accountability on all parties for their actions, whether it be as an individual or as a congregation at a, as a whole. And this is work. It requires humility, vulnerability, and willingness. It requires humility that can stand firm without being easily swayed by any wind, but yet not so firm that it is rigid. It requires vulnerability, holding open the possibility that you might be wrong. You even might have a part in the problem. It takes willingness to sometimes sit with those differences, finding ways to be a flourishing and authentic community in their midst as you work towards reconciliation. It takes work because Jesus prioritizes reconciliation over retribution. He still knows that community damaging behaviors cannot go on indefinitely. He says knowing that part of being faith committees and faith communities are to protect the vulnerable among us and to be a place of sanctuary. Yet when it does come time to separate, Jesus doesn't allow us to gloat or declare victory. Jesus calls us to grieve together any necessary split, rather than fracture into angry factions. Because those factions never resolve the anger or the hurt, or they deny it happened, laying the groundwork for similar circumstances to happen again. Coming together and working on this is that it does this by relying not only on God's desire for us to live good lives together, but that God longs for us to be in relationships that reflect God's coming reign. It remembers that God will provide us what is needed to get to a point of reconciliation in spirit so that we can wish each other well, even if rejoining the community isn't possible. But this is a case where I'm preaching to the choir. For you know how hard this is. The longer I spend time with you and with this congregation, the more you've begun to share your stories and feelings from having to terminate a pastor because he lost his standing. There is still bewilderment by some, hurt by others, and a little wariness. These events harm not only the party's men, but some of the relationships within the congregation. And honestly, I won't say it's going to be easy, but it will take some time to heal. But I've already seen that healing and reconciliation taking place. That reaching out to others who you disagree with, who voted one way or the other. There are some of you that know there was some that we've had to let go, who chose to sever their relationship with this congregation, even with some of its individual members. And there are some who are still working through that process of reconciliation, as is the congregation as a whole. But you are doing it. I am overjoyed when I walk down the stairs after I greeted the last person at the door and hear the conversation and laughter coming up from the tables at fellowship. Trust me, I wasn't hearing that a year and a half ago. More people are starting to dip back in, and you've been welcoming them graciously, even joyfully. And in your individual conversations with me about that time, the tone has started to shift from one of anger and betrayal 
to acknowledging those feelings of betrayal, confession, confusion, and hurt. Even the struggle of how you put this vent into everything here. You are in the process of what Debbie Thomas believes. That in the mess and the muck of life together, we cling to the promise of resurrection. And we honor the outsider as a beloved of God. I would add that we hold on to the promise of reconciliation, either on this side of death or the other. For this passage reminds us that as followers of Jesus, we are already on the same side of the table. Even when we find we are unwilling or unable to sit at it at the moment, we try and try and try again to allow God to reconcile the community in truth and love. But no matter what happens, even if separate paths must be taken, we still treat each other as Jesus did those tax collectors and Gentiles, as God treats us, treats us with compassion, as one of the beloved children of the Holy One, who God longs to be reconciled not only with each other, but with God's own self. Amen. I invite all who are able in body or spirit to stand and join me in hymn number 388, Helps Accept Each Other. They are words on the page, so it was halfway down the page to look for it.
Are there any joys or concerns to be lifted up this morning besides those that are already in the bulletin? Yes, Clayton. Margaret Dietrich is an ICU at Mayo in the Cross. She, was she moved there recently? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, she's been at St. Joel's. Now, when I saw her on the Tuesday I visited, um, she wasn't in ICU at that point. So they moved her since then? Yeah, they moved her since then. Okay. All right, so Margaret is now in ICU at Mayo in um, La Crosse. And Randy is with us. Any others? Then let us lift our hearts and spirits in prayer, first with silence and then with words. God, whose power comes through love and compassion. How grateful we are for your reconciling ways. We see this in the prophets who call us back into right relationship with you and with others. We recognize this in the ministry of Jesus, who reaches out to those others push away. We experience this through Jesus' death and resurrection, when even then, he refused to abandon us, yet again offered us the ways of abundant life. If only we could live that way always with each other. If only we could always have the spirit that puts us on the same, time, same side of the table with each other, even when we don't agree on the ways to address problems or crises. Change our hearts and minds to recognize a beloved sibling in your family. When we disagree with someone over the way they do something, in their beliefs, or in their practices. Reform us into witnesses to your love and ways, allowing others to see through us your ways of reconciling differences and restoring communities that can flourish as well as stand for your ways of justice and welcome. For it is needed here, here in this nation and throughout the world. For there is enough pain and hurt in the world, O oh God, without our adding it through judgments or ideologies. We think of the people of Morocco, mourning thousands dead, more missing, and in fears of aftershocks that would bring more destruction. Open our hearts and our resources to provide the rescue and recovery needed in this land at this time. Wildfires are destroying lives as well as property of God throughout the world. Whether it be in Maui or Europe or Canada, Wherever fires may be raging, we ask for you to bring about their end. Protect those who are attempting to stop their spread as they rescue those in the flame's path. Help us to recognize where and how we might be contributing to their intensity and frequency. We long for your spirit to bring us to the same side of the table to recognize this crisis even as we differ over ways to fix the damage. And we lift up to you those who are hurting, O oh God, in body, mind, or spirit. We lift up Randy, and are glad that he's able to join us today and give thanks for that. We lift up Margaret as she continues to have health struggles, and as the doctors and nurses and all the staff care for her, and try to figure out what is going on. Yet we are grateful too. Grateful for the people who came together for yesterday's Hope For You Suicide Awareness Walk in Fountain City. For all the walkers who gave up their time and energy. Organizations that offered resources for help and prevention. 
and for those who came seeking help. We give thanks for the families who were willing to acknowledge the death of their loved ones so that others might not have to experience such a loss. Surround them all with your spirit of love and compassion, as well as a determination to bring more mental health services to this area that is vastly and immediately needed. And we give you thanks for our communities, both those of our cities and towns and those of our faith, that you gather us in so that we may walk this life together, giving each other support and love and carrying the other whenever needed. Holy One, we lift up all these prayers as well as the unspoken ones of our hearts and spirits. In the name of Jesus, using the words with which he taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and renew us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of our Amen. As we come to our time of offering our gifts for the ministry of this congregation, both inside and outside these walls, as always, I invite you to reflect on the past week and all the gifts that you've offered, not only of resources, but of time, of love, of presence. Let's take out this morning's offering.
prayer of dedication. Gracious God, thank you for the gifts you give and allowing us to be gift givers as well. May our generous offerings bear fruit to nurture our community, our neighbors, and all creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 395, In Christ There Is No East or West.